Okay, let's start. Okay, thank, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is session one of Track A, and uh, the impact of the information and how to refer. So, um, so we will have we will be having three presentations and uh, discussions. The time allocation is going to be the following. So we're going to have 20 minutes for the, for the presentation. Uh, we're going to ask you to poll questions until the end. Uh, then we're going to have uh, 10 minutes for discussion. And then after that, we're going to have 10 minutes for, for the next. Um, so yeah, that being said, uh, for presentation by Fernando uh, Cirelli, so all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so my paper is about households that uh, keep the money in the bank and how inflation might be proportionally affect them. For me, thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. So this paper is about... Uh, so this paper is about the study of the wealth because of inflation from a child that has been previously overlooked or understood by the and it is simply the idea that inflation reduced house variability to a smooth uh, temporary shock. So I will argue that in periods of high inflation, the real rate of household savings push down. It makes saving more costly for people. It is more difficult, more costly to save the smooth temporary shock in periods of high inflation for households. And this channel will be motivated by two observations that we document in your data. Observation number one is when you look at households' portfolio in liquid assets, most of the household have all the money in the bank. They are not invested. They, they don't have a cent in the market. And on top of that, banks keep deposits low and not raise interest rates in periods of high inflation. So the Fed will tighten, but banks will not increase one to one interest rate with this house. So I think questions are supposed to be in the end, but I can. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a short, that it's short, it's short time. It's a tight 20 minute presentation, um, but very happy to answer the question. You know. So on the question of how much this matter, I would write down a model. Probably the model will tell me that's doesn't matter a lot. That probably was your question, or it will matter a lot. Uh, so I will try to study how, how, how relevant this is and who bears the cost along, along the wealth distribution. I will try to match uh, these two facts with my model by incorporating a portfolio choice. And here it says non-competitive banking sector to match these two facts. And then I will simulate an increase in inflation target. And what the model will tell me is that these costs are high, especially for households at the bottom of the world institution. Okay? So we start with the data. Um, so I would motivate this idea that households, so inflation distorts the real rate of saving on the relevant asset use for smooth temporary shocks. And the household finance kind of agreed right now that when you want to look at how able a household does smooth temporary shock, you want to look at liquid assets. So the question is, what is the relevant interest rate on liquid assets for the households? Um, so in other words, which, which is the interest rate that we put on the other equation? Uh, and when you look at household portfolio in liquid assets, there's very limited financial market participation. So in particular, we define bank-dependent households, which are households that have all their financial assets in the bank. This is the fact I will document first. And second, I will show you how banks treat these households. I will show you that banks keep interest rates low in period of tightening and do not pass interest rate uh, changes by the time. So fact number one is about household liquid assets. And every time I mention liquid assets here, think about financial assets excluding pension funds. That is, any, any type of bank deposits, money market accounts, bond, stock, mutual funds, whatever you have in mind that those can, can hold directly. So I will use the survey of consumer finances, and I will ask, for instance, in Rafael's house, so the, the, the survey person goes there and ask Rafael, where do you have your assets? And if Rafael says, I have $100 in the bank deposits, zero, 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 I would say Rafael is a bank dependent household. But then I will go to Gonzalo's house, and Gonzalo says, I have $100 in bank deposits, $2 in the money market fund. I would say Gonzalo is not a bank dependent household. This is a very really stark definition of this extensive margin. Do you hold an asset outside the bank, or you don't hold an asset outside the bank? And I will show you how many of these households are in the US. So this is a time series. It starts in the 1955 to 2019, which is the last survey we have. And each bar is a wave of the survey of consumer finance. So, for instance, this line here shows that in 2007, 65% of all the households in the US have all the money in bank deposits. That is, they don't even have a cent outside the bank. What is striking in this picture is not only that the number is very high, but we expect in the zero round household to have all the money in the bank because the opportunity cost is very high, very low. But if you look at the red line, which is the interest rate that this household can enjoy in an asset outside the bank with equal liquidity and equal safeness, think about the super short term ETF of Russians. This is a 
I would say a proxy for HLC, it's a better way. We know it's very high in the 70s, there's periods of tightening periods of freezing, yet households do not break the banking market, households do not decay investors in the US, even though the fertility costs have been very high for many years. So it's a high share of have all the money in the bank, and that extensive margin doesn't seem to break. Yet this is not enough for inflation to be costly for these companies, because if banks will pay them the red line, then they will not suffer the cost of inflation. But the second key fact is that banks don't pay these household the expected interest rate. And this is not a novel fact, it's something undocumented that other bankers do. There are two types of bank accounts in the US, saving deposits, which include money market deposit accounts, are all checking this rate. So if you look at these two rates, and the black line is at least what the Fed, uh, the relevant monetary policy rate of the Fed. So we know what this picture shows that there is a spread between what you can get in the market and what you can get in a high interest rate deposit in the bank. This spread becomes higher in period of tightening, smaller in period of easing, but there's always a spread there. And it's even more relevant when you look at the checking, the median checking deposit rate, which is zero, has been zero for the US. So this, this has will suffer a huge political cost in the trend, which becomes higher in tightening and lower in easing. So I want to use these two parts to motivate the model and say, how much this harms household ability to save in a smooth consumption. And for that, I move to a model. So in the paper, I documented a lot of other things, how relevant that is household in the semi market, how wealthy they are, which several other things, but these are the two parts that motivate my model. So I will write on a model, which is a quantitative model, which is a central banking conference. We all are aware of a new way of the digitalization of the UK So you have to put those lenses on here. So there are um, multiple agents. That try to smooth income shocks. So they would receive periods of unemployment, periods of booming, and they would try to smooth them using a liquid same pattern. Now, uh, this is so if my mother wants to uh, study the cost of inflation through this channel, I have to replicate the two parts I don't mean later. Right? This, this wish is extensive margin and this imperfect path from banks to the monetary policy rate. Right? And for this, I incorporate these two uh, new ingredients into the model. The first one is a portfolio choice. So, how to the model? Will be choosing between the two types of bank deposits, checking and savings, and also uh, investing in the market. And the second in key ingredient and novel in this literature is incorporating non competitive banking sector into this type of model. So banks will have market power to step in the deposit interest rate. I will keep the model standard. Supply side and, and, and government will be as you were taught in, in, in a school or on the new initial model. Very simple supply, very simple. Okay, I will spend some minutes on these two key novel facts, key novel corporations. Uh, so I, I, you're going to split the household problem in two sub problems. First problem is where do I want to park my assets? Second problem is how much do I want to consume and how much do I want to save, given that I have chosen that for failure. So there will be no role for transaction in the asset side. That is, there is non, no pecuniary benefit to holding checking, savings, or government bonds. It is the traditional Pridman Lucas type of Benefits of non pecuniary benefits holding cash will not invest in the model. If a household can access, can access multiple assets, they will park the money in the asset with a higher return. Uh, but there will be two types of household in this model that will be ex ante heterogeneous. One I will call a sophisticated, and then I will call invest. And the only difference is at which cost they can access to each of these assets. So, unsophisticated household, we have to decide. Uh, oh, this is the product here. Um, we have to decide do I want to pack the money in the checking deposit or do I want to pack the money in the saving deposit? And the assumption is that we can freely pack the asset in the checking deposit, but if they want to access to a high return saving account provided by the bank, they will have to pay a cost F, and I will show you how it enters the utility function that is here. But the investor find it freely that can easily invest in checking or saving deposit at this at no cost, so they will always choose to pack the savings. In the selling deposit, but if they want to access to the bond market, they have to pay a cost F. Okay, so I will uh, jump the slide to, to show you the very many questions that is there. So, a house costs enter the, the, the period with a draw on the fixed cost, and this fixed cost is draw IID period by period with a mean that depends on the group, at the variance that is independent of the group. And you have to decide do I want to buy the asset in the low account or do I want to buy the asset in the higher return account? And this cost. Uh, enters the household duty function in the form of a non pecuniary cost. That is, I will interpret this cost as a search or a mental effort to set up the higher return account that my group uh, holds. 
So you might think many things about this, and I'm happy to discuss them. But this IMD assumption will give me a lot of bouncing around investor on investor and so on. But it's actually not true because the relevant state variable to take the decision is how wealthy you are. The probability cost of not investing is a spread time wealth. So if the household is, is wealthy, wealth is very persistent in this model. So the household will be investor for many, many reviews, exactly as the data. And if it's not wealthy, then it will be not investor for very many people. So we want to have this picture in mind, these two populations decided what to plan the money. So once each of these households uh, choose to go left or right, to low return or high return, this is a very simple view type in complete market problem. They, they maximize consumption and leverage utility, discounted by future value functions. They inherit some wealth from previous period. They work and hours at which W, S is the idiosyncratic shock on income that follows a very simple AR1 process that is hidden behind here. So all the risk is coming from the income side. Uh, there is no borrowing at the household side. They say how much to consume and how much to save. And the only difference between going left or right, that is low return or high return, is at which interest rate this household will be saving that thing. That is, if I decide to be investor, sorry, if I decide to go and plant in bonds, I will be saving at the bond interest rate, savings at the same interest rate, and checking at the checking system. Okay. So at this household problem, once you aggregate it across households, you raise to two key demands. The demand for checking deposits and the demand for saving deposits, which is the sum of all the households that decide to invest in checking and how much they sell to, to save in checking and the same for saving deposits. And this will be relevant for the banking problem. But the second key innovation is how what the financial sector is called to do the buy in this problem. So there are banks, there are a bunch of banks, they very small. A unit measure of them that receive a sample of the population each period. So each of them receives a draw of the population and they will receive a new draw in the next period. The assumption is that these banks are sufficiently big to influence consumption saving decisions across households, but they cannot influence uh, aggregate or price. And the key, another assumption is that households are not allowed to switch banks. So if Gonzalo comes to my bank, Gonzalo is for this period, but tomorrow we'll bank with uh, Rafael. Now, Banks are multi product funds. They issue checking deposits and saving deposits exactly as in the data. They get the money and they park in a form of one another. So it's a very simple banking problem. So simple that it's probably the simplest banking problem you saw and you will see in this context. Banks choose checking and saving interest rate. They receive a demand for checking. They receive a demand for saving. For each dollar they receive in checking, they get a spread. For each dollar in savings, they get a spread. And the only constraint is you cannot go below zero in nominal terms. It is the only constraint. That these banks have handled. Now, it's probably yet very simple. It's a very complicated problem in, the, in which the bank is choosing two products with two different populations, how to decide optimally how um, high to set each of the interest rates. Now, there are a lot of interesting economics of this problem. I explained the paper, but we'll jump right to the result because there are only five minutes left. Um, so, there are two key moments that the is what I need to capture if I want to explore the cost of inflation. First is who holds checkings and saving deposits. Why is it relevant? If all the holders of checkings are poor, literally they have three cents in the checking account, then nobody cares about the cost of inflation because these households are not safe. So you want to explore whether these households give in the wealth distribution. Are they savers or are they not safe? And second, how quickly these households can escape the saving account once inflation comes up. Inflation is high, the political cost becomes high, maybe these households will move very quickly to the high interest rate assets. Now, to discipline the, the, the elasticity, how quickly these households migrate, I will try to match the spreads. That is why the spreads are relevant measure to integrate elasticity because it's a monopolistic bank. The spread is proportional to elasticity. So we match the spread. And on top of that, I will try to match who holds each asset across the wealth division. I'll try to show you how this model does in these two regards. This picture is trying to show how much, how well the model match the wealth division. And sorry, the wealth division condition and holding each asset. Dark colors is the model, light colors is the data. First, look at this picture. This picture says, the data says if you hold checking accounts as your, as your uh, highest interest rate, then you are very poor. There are a few households that are wealthy that hold checking deposit only, but they are mostly very poor. The model says the same. In the model, households hold checking deposit only are very, very poor. If you hold save, uh, saving deposit as your highest interest rate, then you are mid wealth. And if you invest in the market exactly or very similar to the data, you are probably on the right side of the wealth division. So this, I would say the model does reasonably well in, in trying to match the conditional wealth distribution of the household, conditional holding each asset. 
Now, the second key moment is how banks respond to increasing the Fed interest rate. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so suppose there is a shock that makes the Fed increase interest rate. Now, what does the, the model say on, on the interest rate of the bank set? The model exactly the same data says that the bank optimally che che keep the checking interest rate at the zero rebound and not imperfectly leave the saving interest rate after the bond uh, interest rate increase. And economists are very interested in that the bank is dealing with two populations and want to take advantage of the high inflation to squeeze the households that are using checking deposits. And in order to prevent them moving to a saving deposit account, they don't leave one to one the interest rate on saving, if not household you want to save. So there uh, are very interesting intuitions on that that this seminar does allow me to do uh, to show that uh, yeah, this is the reason why the, the model can be this imperfect path to, to bank interest rates. Um, so let me say one other thing that this, this model or previous models cannot do, which is matching quantity fluctuation. There is something that is not very popular in the macro literature, is how much deposits move. We have this idea that deposits are very sticky. But when you look at the data on deposit movement, one percent is very increase in Fed rate because a drop. This is like uh, using local projection of fifteen percent of total deposit. This is a massive flow in and out of the deposit money. Yet the model said when interest rate increased one percentage point, then we more definitely this idea of a fall of fifteen percent on total deposit. Yet the model can do this even though the extensive margin is not fluctuating. It's, it's not causing a lot of households to move in and out the banking sector. It's only causing the rich households. To move the money outside of banking sector. Okay, so two minutes on the on the results, three minutes actually, which is back to the question: how costly is inflation? Now we simulate from the calibrated three percent uh, state state inflation trend to a six percent interest rate, and ask the question: who suffers from inflation? And for that, I need to, to see how do banks respond in the long run. Because this is the long run exercise; it's not the short run. We know how they respond in the short run in this picture here. But what's happening in the long run? And this is what the, this table is saying. This table is saying that banks keep checking deposit interest rate at the zero rebound, causing a 3% drop, percentage point drop in the real interest rate of this household. Yet, the saving deposit market seems to be isolated in the long run from inflation. Actually, it's something the real rate increases. And bondholders are also isolated in the new system of inflation um, from, from the bond market. Um, Going one to one, the nominal rate of inflation. Now, the question is why banks do this? Why banks move one to one the saving in the long run differently from the short run? And the, the intuition is in the long run, maybe these households use checking deposits are losing deposits. They optimally are eating their time. But and funds move to the top of the wealth distribution. Now, banks want to keep these households. And the way banks keep these households is by increasing the saving interest rate one to one and not cutting the margin. Yet they want to extract a larger markup on these households stick. To a checking account. So, in, in other words, inflation increases wealth concentration because it's moved that push down the interest rate on the bottom of the institution and push up the interest rate on the, on the top of the wealth institution. <laughs> now, on, on a number of how costly this, um, this um, challenge is, so if you ask household in the bottom of the wealth institution, they will tell you so the unsophisticated guys that live in the bottom of the wealth institution, they will tell you this is 0.1% in consumption equivalents or three percentage point increase in inflation. One number that people have in mind when they talk about the world because of inflation is 10% inflation, 1% point. 3% inflation, I'm doing in a population, 0.3 percentage point. This is like in the same order of magnitude and the Freeman or Lucas type of world cost, but it's more in mind for the bottom of the world division. But this comes in the, in the top of the world division, they do not care about inflation. Because the assets they hold are isolated from inflation. So with this channel, I can argue that how in the bottom of the world division will suffer and the mind of the suffer is similar to the previous channel we have studied on the western cost of inflation. So many other things on the paper, but I have 30 seconds to conclude. Uh, so this paper is about exploring this, this role of inflation as a distortion in the in the saving market, motivated through two channels, uh, the idea of household dependent deposit for saving decisions, and that banks keep deposit rates low even though interest rate is going up. Uh, I use the model to say who suffered and how much for inflation. And I argue that the costs are tight down for households and the bottom of the distribution. And it comes with a, a spin of that the second that says that conclusion says that inflation actually seems to increase wealth concentration on the liquid asset market. So, a lot of time and just some time. Thank, Thank you very much. Great. So, we'll have uh, Gonzalo now discussing. Um,
And after that, we can have this Q and A and the question in general. Uh, ah, see, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Let's hope the mic's making place. So, well, so thanks a lot for the for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Well, super interesting. So. Let me begin by by giving a, a quick summary to to complement uh, Fernando's already very clear presentation. So basically, well, this paper begins by the fact that there are many bank dependent households in the U.S. And the definition of bank dependent is that these banks hold basically all of their liquid assets in bank checking accounts, bank savings accounts. They don't directly own bonds or or, uh, or anything like that. And then, beginning by this observation, it develops a model of endogenous spread between bank checking accounts, bank savings accounts, and, and bonds, where these spreads endogenously generate because there are different types of households. There, For each of the assets, there are both sophisticated and unsophisticated households that are demanding that asset, and that together with non-competitiveness in the banking sector is generating that, uh, for instance, in the checking account, everyone's unsophisticated. These people are really inelastic, then the banks drive down the... the basically uh, the nominal return of the asset to zero. While from the other ones, they need to balance the idea, well, I want to keep some of the unsophisticated into the asset, but I want also to take into account that the sophisticated are more elastic and that's going to, to generate the, the different return for each of these vehicles uh, in equilibrium. And then based on this model, he's going to do a policy experiment where he studies the welfare costs of a steady state change in inflation, so basically, uh, Steady state inflation came to this percent that we were, that we were mentioning before. Uh, and he finds that the costs are morally, mostly borne by low wealth households. These are the types that are going to be mostly locked in in the zero interest paying taken accounts. And therefore, they're going to face large negative real rates if they want to save, which is going to discourage them from saving. That means that they're going to lose ability to smooth consumption, that also increases. Uh, wealth inequality, whilst the returns to savings deposits and to bonds are going to increase endogenously in this higher steady state, uh, higher steady state inflation regime. So let me give you a couple of what I think is, is super uh, interesting about the paper. So there's great data analysis on the history of bank deposits, uh, uh, whether people were using checking accounts, savings accounts. It develops a theory of endogenous spreads on these different savings vehicles, together with a heterogeneous agent model in which there are non-competitive banks. So I think this is, this is a really great contribution to the literature that puts these frictions of access to financial markets in the spotlight, in the sense it's complementary to all of this literature about financial literacy and the role for, for wealth accumulation and wealth inequality. And uh, the policy experiment highlights a super policy relevant topic right now, which is the heterogeneous impact of, of inflation. So let me give a, a couple of comments on the paper. First of all, uh, I want to mention something about these elasticities in the model and in the data. By elasticity, I mean, what is the response of um, the holdings of the different types of deposits as there is a shock to the economy, for instance, like a monetary policy tightening? So. Uh, the paper shows a plethora of analysis in, in the data. It shows that the stable of bank, like the share of bank dependent houses is relatively stable. It shows the reactions of deposit quantities to an instrumented monetary policy shock and also, and also to other types of shocks. And thus, and similar, uh, similar experiments in, in, in the model. And it concludes basically by looking at all of these experiments that uh, they are qualitatively similar in the sense that the households that hold most of their savings in checking accounts are relatively constant. They don't seem to react very much to, to, to changes in, in, in relative return and so on. And it shows that the reactions of deposit quantities to these shocks are, are, are relatively reasonable. But I think here it would be much nicer, it would make the paper punch here, if you could just focus on one experiment and say, well, can I show the reaction of, for instance, uh, the amount of, of households that are investing in, in the different types of, of, uh, of assets and how they react to, to a certain shock, 
the amounts to that compared with the model, this could be both an ex post or a, or a, um, a experiment, or it could be part of the of the estimation in the model. This could be a monetary shock, but could be something different. But that would be really convincing if we really want to understand the reactions that in the model, which is basically about there's a shock, how do people change their their savings across across this? Mess. This connects with with my second point, which is about the nature of the main policy experiment. So in the main policy experiment. Steady state inflation goes up from three to six percent, and that stays there permanently. Checking rates stay at zero, and the relative costs of investing in these different types of accounts for these different types of households stay constant. And I would say this is, I mean, this is a big experiment, and so this is a large change in steady state inflation. And in this large, very large uh, experiment, it's a bit harder to argue that many things that are kept uh, exogenous stay exogenous. For instance, these costs of participation. So I mean, maybe uh, suddenly, if inflation is forever six percent, then I will care a bit more about comparing different savings vehicles. My friends will tell me about alternative savings accounts and so on. But there will be additional mechanisms apart from the pure financial that that could explain uh, uh, different reactions of households. So could, for instance, competition in the banking sector. Although then you could tell me that in the current situation. The interest rates on both savings accounts and checking accounts are really growing very, very slowly, but they are. And if we're thinking about a, a steady state experiment, if we're thinking about 10 years' time, I guess they, they would eventually somehow hold to that damn tenability effect. I think your historical empirical analysis is great to speak at this question, but it would be great to know even a bit more of how were people, I mean, I know there are data limitations, but how were people moving between like checking accounts and saving accounts, say, in the 70s? Because I guess it makes sense that when the inflation becomes more salient, people care more about it, so that they, they move a bit more their 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 savings. Uh, in general, what I'm writing in here is this concern is the experiment you're doing is a bit off sample with respect to to the estimation of the model. That's of course natural because you can, these big changes in inflation uh, didn't happen at least until now. Uh, but it would be good to to know a bit more about that. And third main comment. Uh, is about other assets. So basically, in this model, you're focusing for for liquid you know, liquid assets, and that's of course uh, uh, we understand why, and it's already a, a computationally intensive model. But in reality, households hold wealth in many other asset houses. They have mortgages. They can choose to postpone durable consumption. They can choose time their mortgage repayment, and so on. So all of these things. I mean, of course, I'm not asking you to model all of these, but just to take into account that. These things might dampen a bit these this, the effects in the model because well I mean maybe I don't have an access to to I mean maybe the checking account I have access to has lower real returns but I can still buy a house I can just adjust my mortgage repayments and, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, the main reason to save in the model and what's generating all of the welfare losses here is pure consumption smoothing. However, there are many other reasons to save. One, one uh, simple example is, is life cycle reasons to save. And this might play in the opposite direction, because if you want to save, because you want to uh, save for retirement or pay the education of your kids or whatever, and you're unsophisticated and you're holding uh, much of this money in, in, in bank accounts that pay low real rates, then this might actually increase the welfare losses. So, I mean, of course, uh, it's easy to complicate other people's models, but basically it would be nice to have a bit of an idea of how all of these factors could matter when we're thinking about this, this, these welfare returns, because in the end, the result is big. Like it's something, it's not that far from really closing access to asset markets to, to this household. So it would be nice to, to see that. And let me finalize with one, one curiosity in, in a bit of advertising. The curiosity is maybe this is another paper where it would be super interesting to know what happens with QE because QE, you're focusing on a traditional monetary tightening and that, that's nice, but uh, many in many central banks in the world, QE uh, was implicitly or explicitly targeting returns and yields on bonds and particular savings vehicles, so it might affect have different inequality effects to the ones you show. I thought that would be great to look at, but again, possibly different paper. Last thing is in the model, the key thing households uh, so uh, in the model the key reason to to save is to ensure against shocks to your labor market income 
but you have a very simple formulation of those. I mean, you, you acknowledge it already. And there's the advertising part. In our GIA paper, we propose a super simple way of, of putting these more flexible learning dynamics. So kurtosis, skewness, nonlinear persistence, the shocks are different for different points of the distribution, all of these things that recent literature has, has cared about. And it's really super easy to, to just put directly into a model because it's just state spaces, transition matrix, and you put it into there. So I think it would be great for this paper to do a bit of robustness in, in, in that direction. And that was the advertising part. So thanks a lot. So uh, I would say, Fran, if you want to reply to Sal, uh, yeah, uh, and we can take questions. So, well, very kind discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I would need to. Uh, 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 so, it was a very kind discussion. Thank you, Sal. Um, so two things. I'm, I'm absolutely aware the world is a bit disconnected from the data. So, I, it, it, my view of the world is that the model should do the same exercise I do in the data. I couldn't do it for a matter of time. I think. Uh, I will try to replicate this plot, the first plot I show you about the um, this has what being fixed on the train and also on the cycle. I just do a one input response. It's not ideal because the data I show is not that. Uh, so point absolutely taken. Um, yeah, I need to work more on the connection data on the model. I show some qualitative things that the model can do, but it was not absolutely precise. So I agree this is a thing I'm fully aware of. On the cost, FU being constant, I mean, what, what is skeptical? On it. So once you start playing with things, where do you go? That's the way I see. It. So the data seems to show that these cows are very rigid. So we have this view on the, the Robin Hood came and everybody invested in the US, but I'm very much looking forward for a way of printing the food and the video. It's yeah, the term the finances. My my hunch is that this just a few tiny households. Um so I really this FU didn't change, but maybe you are right. I think a new wave would provide a lot of evidence in that because it comes with high spreads and on top of that with new wave of, of technology. I think that data point are very much looking forward to it that will inform on that uh, technical. On other assets, your point is absolutely uh, well taken. Uh, why I don't have durables is purely computational uh, reasons. And also I'm working on the evidence to see where do these households move the assets? Do they consume the assets? Do they uh, purchase a car? Do they renew the car? Um, I think we are not fully aware of how this, this implies in the portfolio rebalancing. But yet, I think that if households move to do that, that is still will be in line with my exercise. Because if you hold a car and you experience too much of unemployment, we don't see households massively selling cars to, to smooth consumption. So, in, in terms of smoothing temporal shocks, what matters is liquid assets. In my model, it will, it will show us increasing consumption. Uh, in a model with two assets, we show up purchasing a car. But then, if an employment shock hits you, you will be with lower uh, liquid assets, then you will suffer from your know, inability to smooth consumption. On the QE, I have a problem. It's a great point, uh, something I need to, to work on. And in your uh, earning dynamics, yes, I agree. Earning are much more risky than the one I put. We know that simply our one processes don't match the kurtosis and, and the riskiness we see in the data. So may have you cited your paper, I will try to use that in the Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So I think your question was the first one. <laughs> yeah, I think you answered that, but I I have another question. So in the models about the Western companies that I'm used to with flexible prices, there's usually there's always a plot where, where people show how they're matching money in it. And so I know you don't have money in the model, but you have components of that one. So I'm wondering if you have an idea how well you're matching that. So when you mean matching money demand, which is like the elasticity in one Yeah, well, usually the product, yeah, basically the elasticity, but usually they have a product of money demand, of money of the version of our clients, the short term interest rates. Well, I can do that. It's something I can do, like uh, simulate the model and then plot very uh, safely to the data. I won't call it demand, I will call it equilibrium points. Uh, but uh, this is something I can do. The, the closest I get with the model is how the elasticity of deposits move with interest rates. Yeah. Uh, I show in the data this is a massive outflow, and the model can qualitatively reproduce that. So it's the closest I can get. So I, I admit that I have trouble with these theory models when they're presented in these short summaries. And so this may be my fault and not yours, but I don't understand how this could be even remotely the welfare losses that you find. 
So if you if I think about a representative <laughs> household, let's say seventy thousand dollars a year in household income and three thousand dollars in their checking account, then and they and they are the rate of the real rate of return on their checking account goes down by three percent. That's ninety dollars a year in lost interest, right? So if we didn't let them substitute, and presumably substituting actually is in their interest, right? They substitute away from the checking accounts because they think that that actually helps them, right? So if we didn't let them substitute. That would be that 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 should be the maximum loan for us. So ninety dollars over seventy thousand dollars household income. That one basis. So you are not doing this is accounting, etc. This is third problem. Well, yes, yeah. I have thirty dollars, hundred dollars, ten percent inflation, ten dollars. But that's the accounting view of the world. No? But then this council has to decide. They want to call less or more. And with high inflation, this council will withdraw their assets more and more and more and more. It's not just inflation. You don't keep ninety dollars. They will say no, no, no. Where high inflation environment. They want to hold less assets and less assets and less assets. And then they suffer an employment spell. And they confront that employment spell with, low, with lower amounts of liquid assets. So does, aren't they made better off by being able to reduce their assets in the face of inflation? Yes, but you're not taking into account the ability of this household to smooth consumption. But isn't the household taking that into account or not? They are endogenously. I allow them to substitute. They are better than if I don't allow them to substitute. Yes, the welfare cost comes from this thing that endogenously they are willing to pay more, more risk because this is. Reducing the asset is the optimal thing to do. It's not just the accounting $90 that, that costs the, the worst loss of inflation. It's, it's $90 plus endogenous response that optimally is helpful cut down, and then they confront more risk. It's, if, it's, yeah, I don't know if I can say. I, I, I guess I, I still don't understand. In, that, in other words, oh, if you look at no, no, cultural consumption volatility in yeah. this environment, because yeah. it's increased in the yeah. high inflation system. That's why inflation is more costly. But households, but households could choose to have the accounting bundle, right? They could Absolutely. choose the, to have. And then we know how much they would lose if they chose the old bundle, right? It would yes. be, in my example, ninety dollars a year. So how? So so shouldn't it be smaller or loss that's smaller than the accounting, not bigger? So in, in, in your view of the world, I have to do fixing the accounts plus computing the consumption volatility, and I think that loss will be higher. It's not that the ninety dollars is fixing the accounts and then imputing the consumption volatility with that with those costs, and that will be higher than my model. Not it's not only accounting with matters, but I think it's from some but it's a, it's a good point. I, I need to have a better answer. So, a question on the focus on deposits of the assets. So, you know, inflation is also bad for stocks. Uh, you know, Michael's paper shows that firms because of sticky prices, stocks are not indexed to inflation, and so you know, firms with more sticky prices have lower returns, for example. So, that suggests that uh, inflation should also hurt the rich. Um, which could, you know, reverse your result on inequality. What, what are your thoughts on that? So your point is absolutely that a million Chinese why inflation can cut the poor or the rich, and mortgages uh, being fixed is something that benefits the poor uh, and, and hurts the, 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 the rich. Your Chinese one also hurts the rich because prices drop. But all these times are in the budget short term. Right? We, we see some price of inflation, we hold some asset, then uh, it, the price drop. Then I'm back and, and what's up. But if you, if you think about my exercise, not the state table to state combined, which we think that all these real assets, real rate is kept constant in this point. Well, no, but my exercise was also so you know. But uh, so the why, why do you think that more to be prices will also have lower returns? But you have to think that these firms do not index in plan. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have we live we need to live in a world I mean, there's of limited index, say. absolutely. Then I will have to take into account this challenge and it probably will also be not or harm the poor, the rich households or not the poor. Um, but this depends very much on what is your assumption on price indexation. In my mind, I do full price indexation. Uh, but if I don't do it, then all the sticky prices in location will come up, your channel will come up. So, yeah. But this is, so my view of the paper is that this is challenge and we isolate from all of them and complete the work for us. Yeah. We have time for one more question. No one? Okay. Yeah, that's not. Yeah. Another reason why <laughs> might be beneficial for the poor is because many of them are borrowers. So the fisheries attack those in. So the, the thing is, if you think about liquid assets, you think about liquid debt, sorry, you think about credit cards. Um, so how do credit card interest rates move with inflation itself is the question. Um, if you live in a world where these banks will pass one-to-one -one interest rate on credit cards, then it will not benefit the, the poor. I think the data says that there's no full pass 
So probably what you're saying is correct. This is not the real rate at which it has our borrowing grows. Uh, so your point is absolutely well taken. I think these households are like 20% of the household in the US. If you exclude those 20% that have negative liquid debt, uh, liquid asset, then my more is true for the rest of the 80% of the population. So I wanted to focus on the assets because it has a big study, but I think it's not way to think of what happens banks will issue debt for this which is yeah. And also I don't don't have good data on credit card interest rate. It's something I'm missing. Uh, that I need to do uh, that calculation. Great. Uh, thanks everyone. Okay, so uh, thanks so much for uh, having me here. So it's a pleasure to present uh, another related paper on um, the you know redistributive consequences of inflation here. Uh, but I'm going to focus more on optimal monetary policy design. Okay, so uh, so I I think he thinks you are in this room. You all know that you know there has been lots of empirical literature on uh, the on the heterogeneous impact of inflation on different groups of households. So on the other hand, in recent years, major central banks around the world, including the US Federal Reserve and also the ECB, they both advocate the so-called inclusive goal of their monetary policy framework. So in which like pay special attention to the low and middle income households in their objective function. So this paper asks the following question, that is how such redistributive consequences of inflation across households is gonna affect the design of optimal monetary policy. So the paper are going to consider uh, inflation's uh, redistributive effects uh, uh, through a few different channels. Then I'm going to study the optimal monetary uh, policy rule in a quantitative uh, dynamic model that uh, capturing all of these channels. So the main channels I consider in this project are the following. Okay, so uh, the the main channels I'm going to consider in this project are the following. So the first, so essentially, I'm going to consider how inflation is going to affect household differently through their different consumption baskets, through their different nominal asset position, and also through their different labor earning exposure exposure to business cycles. So the first channel I consider is this expenditure channel. So we know that households they differ in their consumption baskets. Uh, which has different uh, price rigidity. So in the uh, empirical literature, people have shown that usually it is the low-income households who has a consumption baskets who bear higher inflation cost. The second channel I consider is this uh, revaluation channel, which is also known as the Fisher channel in the literature. So we know that unexpected uh, inflation is going to erode the, the real value of both nominal asset and also nominal liability so that it is going to redistribute from the net nominal creditors to the net nominal borrowers. And the classical empirical literature uh, by Dobke and Schneider has shown that uh, at least in the advanced economies like in the US, it is mostly the low and middle income households who are the net nominal borrowers who might benefit from surprise inflation through this channel. And last channel I consider is this so-called uh, earnings channel. So we know that inflation is going to usually co-move with uh, real output through this Phillips curve relationship. And uh, for households in different you know, income groups, their labor earning usually has heterogeneous uh, exposure to these business cycle changes. And the recent empirical literature has shown that uh, you know, it's mostly people who are at the bottom and also the very top of the income distribution. So their labor earning, their real labor earning are more sensitive to aggregate output. So we may also infer that their labor earning are also more sensitive to inflation. So as you can see, so these three channels actually correspond to the consumption asset and also labor income in a, in a household budget constraint we usually write down, which is sort of make this analysis more, uh, uh, more, more comprehensive in terms of thinking about redistributive consequences of inflation. Okay, so uh, with all these channels in mind, in this paper, uh, I'm going to develop a quantitative, uh, a general quantitative framework to study optimal policy rules uh, with redistributing inflation. 
So the core part of this uh, framework is, uh, you know, uh, is, is this new model and also uh, this numerical uh, solution uh, framework for, for, for this kind of classes. So in the paper, I develop a, a, a two sector uh, heterogeneous agent new Keynesian Hank model. So in which I introduce a few uh, new elements to the you know, classic Hank model so that I can capture these redistributed channels. So first of all, this is a two sector Hank model with uh, uh, non homothetic preferences and also different uh, price rigidity across different sectors. So that you know, with this structure, uh, households with, with different income levels, they are gonna endogenously have have different consumption uh, consumption baskets, and the price dynamics of those consum different consumption baskets are going to be different. So this is going to capture this expenditure channel. So the sec secondly, which is more very standard in this hand literature, that so the households here they face uh, idiosyncratic income risk, and they can save and borrow in nominal assets. So that in the equilibrium, there are going to be a dispersion of nominal asset position, uh, 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 that nominal position in this model. So through which the revaluation channel is going to play a role. And lastly, so I, I am going to explicitly model households uh, earning process to have a heterogeneous elasticity component uh, to business cycles, which is going to help me capture this earnings channel. So I'm going to document uh, those, reveal those empirical facts on the channels uh, for, for my calibration. So with this quantitative framework in hand, I'm gonna study the optimal nonlinear uh, monetary policy rule, which is optimal nonlinear uh, Taylor rule in this model. So the essential exercise I'm gonna do is to compute the expected social welfare uh, uh, of this model uh, when some, some, some aggregate shock hits a steady state. Uh, so the essential thing I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do is to compute the social expect social welfare uh, corresponding to different uh, choices on monetary policy rule to figure out what is the optimal monetary policy would do. Okay, now let me quickly uh, jump into the uh, jump into the, the model. So this is a hand model with non homothetic preferences. So there are going to be a continuum of exanti uh, identical households in the model that uh, uh, they derive utility from the consumption and labor supply. So here the uh, aggregate real consumption is going to uh, be, is comes from this uh, uh, generalized Stongeri non homothetic preferences over two types of goods. So here, by introducing this uh, subsistence level uh, after after consumption in goods A, I'm assuming that I'm explicitly modeled that uh, uh, sector A is a sector that's producing uh, necessary goods. So which also implies that the household expenditure share in sector A is going to you know uh, uh, decrease uh, with with income level. Um, uh, so here, uh, in terms, so as in most of the Hank models, uh, the household they are exposed to idiosyncratic income shocks, and household they can save and borrow in nominal assets uh, with fixed aggregate supply, uh, aggregate uh, uh, fixed aggregate supply. So here, this is this uh, this uh, this is the household budget constraint. So we can see that uh, uh, I, I'm going to explicitly mo have some model for this uh, post tax uh, labor income component. Here, I assume that. This uh, if sort of effective effective labor productivity for households is not just a function of households' idiosyncratic income income state, but also has this heterogeneous elasticity term with respect to the aggregate uh, output change. So I'm later I'm going to uh, calibrate this heterogeneous elasticity, uh, which depends on households' uh, income state, to allow households' labor uh, earning to have different exposures. To aggregate output and also to aggregate inflation. Okay, so in the in the production side, the uh, the model is going to be a you know two sector new Keynesian model with heterogeneous level of price rigidity across these two sectors. Mm -hmm. um, so in each sector, there is going to be a final goods producer uh, which aggregate up uh, the intermediate inputs using the CS aggregator. And uh, the intermediate producers in, uh, in each sector is going to produce with this linear technology with labor as only, only input. And they are going to be the price setter uh, subject to uh, Rotenberg adjustment cost uh, within each sector. So here, uh, the key parameter that differentiates the two sectors is going to be this uh, uh, adjustment cost term, kappa here, so which is different, uh, uh, different across two sectors. So that when some common shots his both sectors, the price dynamics is going to be different. So you, you can see that through this uh, Phillips curve, uh, sectorial level uh, Phillips curve relationship. 
Um, okay, so before uh, talking about uh, optimal monetary policy, then let me be very clear about uh, my assumption uh, in terms of the, the fiscal policy. So the essential, uh, essential idea is so in this project, I'm gonna uh, keep the, the fiscal side as you know very passive and try to mimic what happens in the US economy. So here, there is gonna be this proportion uh, proportional labor income tax uh, uh, on, on and also lump sum transfer on the households and also on the on the production side there are going to be this proportional labor subsidy uh, just to overcome the monopoly power distortion uh, we usually see in this monop monopolistic competition uh, uh, structure in remuneration models which is financed by lump sum tax on intermediate producers there are going to be government spending and here th uh, this is gonna, uh, this is a government uh, budget constraint Okay, so now let me talk about uh, 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 my, com my, my competition of, of social welfare and also the optimal monetary uh, uh, policy. So here I want to be clear that uh, in, this, in this exercise, the monetary policy authority is going to follow a family of nonlinear Taylor rules. So in which they set the nominal interest rate based on their observation of inflation and also output gap. So here to make the monetary policy more flexible and more general, I allow the, the uh, monetary authority to put a different Taylor rule coefficient against positive inflation and negative disinflation. So essentially, the monetary policy rule can be summarized by three key parameters uh, of this Taylor rule uh, equation. Then, uh, so given each choice of the Taylor rule parameter, so I can I can solve the model, you know, uh, nonlinearly with respect to any you know, aggregate shock path, uh, and I can compute the expected uh, expect social welfare with respect to uh, different aggregate shock path. So here in, the, in this project, I define the social welfare uh, in the following way. So you can see there are two components here. The first component is, is sort of relative st uh, standard component. So which is the expected social, uh, expected uh, uh, the present value of the expected, uh, 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 the Pareto weighted present value of, of, the, of the utility across all the households. And there are also gonna, gonna be a second component so which you can see uh, looks like some you know quadratic inflationary cost. So here uh, you can act, so in the in the paper actually I try to set you know this chi equals to to zero, but I can also allow for a positive chi here just to allow for some you know possible special emphasis on price stabilization like uh, you know what is advocated by the European Central Bank. Then the optimal monetary policy rule is just to, going trying to find you know the optimal uh, Taylor rule coefficients. That uh, maximize expect the social welfare, and here in the paper I'm going to focus in on the aggregate shock, just as uh, the demand shocks, which uh, is uh, the wedge of the early equation uh, in the model. So I'm going to uh, 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 skip uh, the the calibration part. Essentially, I'm going to calibrate uh, parameters that correspond to, to each of these three channels, and also some standard calibration. So I just want to say that in the in my baseline uh, analysis. I'm calibrating, I'm calibrating this chi term uh, as you know this coefficient on, on, on inflation cost uh, to match the worker cost of the inflation uh, that was not captured by a standard uh, new Keynesian model. So essentially, I'm gonna I'm going to the uh, this uh, money money search literature trying to you know have a, have an understanding about what a, what a new Keynesian literature is missing about uh, the, the the cost of inflation that I can put. Here in, in this uh, objective term, ob objective function of the central bank. Okay, so now let me present the, the, the main results on all my optimal monetary policy uh, exercise. So besides this full model I just present to you to better understand, you know, this uh, uh, the you know sort of the, the the contribution of each of these three channels uh, in terms of driving this optimal monetary policy results. I'm also going to solving for optimal monetary policy in three uh, counterfactual models. So I'm going to starting with uh, you know this two sector representative agent model, and then adding one you know one redistributive channel in a time, so you can see you know how the results are are varying. <laughs> also, I want to I want to mention that here. So because I, I'm essentially solving finding looking for an optimal policy uh, a parameter, uh, I'm, I'm I'm fixing some search range, so which is a determinancy bound as a lower bound, and also three, which I think is a, is a relatively large number as a Taylor uh, Taylor rule coefficient as as a uh, upper bound. Okay, so here this this is uh, the optimal monetary policy results in the in the full model. So uh, in the in the two panels, I here I, I plot 
how the expected social welfare is going to change as we move along, you know, this uh, search range for uh, for Taylor rule coefficient. So the first thing I want I, I want to mention is that uh, first of all, what I'm not plotting here is about the, how the expect social welfare is changing, you know, when we change the Taylor rule coefficient on output gap. So actually, I find, you know, the the, the, the Taylor rule coefficient on output gap actually has very very small welfare effect. So so from now on, I'm going to set this to zero and only focusing on how the social welfare is going to change uh, with different Taylor rule coefficient on inflation. So here, the left panel uh, uh, plots how the expect social welfare is changing uh, when we have different Taylor rule coefficient against positive inflation. So as you can see, there is, so this is a uh, inverted U shape and there is an optimal uh, uh, Taylor rule coefficient here, which is close to 1.36. So on the, other, on the other hand, so when we plot the expect social welfare, when we change the Taylor rule coefficient against this inflation, we find that this is actually a monotone relationship, which is, means that, you know, the more aggressive you are against uh, the disinflation, the better the social welfare will be, okay. So, uh, so this gives us that sort of the, the main, one of the main results of the paper is that the optimal monetary policy in the Hank model should sort of be asymmetric. So this uh, response to positive inflation is somewhat more, uh, 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 more accommodating. And to better understand this, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So better understand these results. So I'm, 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 I'm going sort of as a few steps back to solving for optimal monetary policy in three kind of factor models. So the first one is a, is a, is a two-sector representative agent model. So I find that in a rank model, uh, the optimal monetary policy uh, parameter should always, optimal monetary policy should always be very ag aggressive against both positive inflation and negative disinflation. But when we add in this revaluation channel, so which is you know, how inflation is redistributed across people who has uh, nominal asset and nominal liabilities, so we find that actually, so here the optimal monetary policy against positive inflation becomes much more accommodative. And if we further adding this uh, expenditure channel, the optimal monetary policy against the inflation becomes a bit more aggressive. And if we finally adding this earnings channel, the optimal monetary policy against inflation becomes a bit more accommodative again. So here to, to summarize this result, you can see that this revaluation channel and also this earnings channel is driving the optimal monetary policy to be more accommodative towards uh, inflation. So why? So the, the intuition behind that is actually uh, uh, quite straightforward. So because through this earnings channel and also revaluation channel, inflation are actually going to be more beneficial to low-income households. So because you know the low-income low-income households. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the low income, low and middle income households, they have more uh, net nominal debt. So which makes the revaluation channel uh, uh, inflation more beneficial to them through the revaluation channel. And also the, the low income households, their labor earnings are more elastic to both aggregate output and also to aggregate inflation, which also makes sort of inflation more uh, beneficial to those people. So on the other, on the other hand, uh, so the, the expenditure channel also makes the, the you know the the price of the consumption bundle of the low income households increases more, so which is makes inflation more more harmful to them. But quantitatively, it's going to be the earnings channel and also revaluation channel that's going to play a dominant role, uh, uh, rather than this uh, 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 that which can offset you know this uh, expenditure channel. So. Uh, and uh, so I also so so with all this exercise done, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to think about if we uh, if a, if we, if the central bank uh, can make a mistake to, to to think about the economy as a representative agent economy and to design optimal monetary policy uh, following the first row instead of you know following the the last row as it should be. So what's gonna be the policy implication? Uh, so here I plot if we 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 change the policy regime. From the optimal rank policy to optimal hank policy, uh, of course, of war, the, the social welfare is going to increase, and uh, the and if we plot the the, the conditional welfare change uh, along both the income and asset distribution, we find it is mostly the low income and low uh, low wealth people who are going to mostly benefit from uh, this policy change, but other people, uh, uh, other households, they are going to uh, uh, be uh, actually be uh, they are going to 
the warfare is going to uh, decrease uh, after the policy change. And also, I, I do this uh, bonobo floating uh, warfare again decomposition to see, you know, when we switch from the optimal rank policy to optimal hank policy, so what's going to be the main mechanism? Uh, so that sort of the, the, the main sources of warfare change. Uh, and I find it's mostly actually comes from the redistribu uh, redistribution uh, component, which is uh, uh, so sort of comes from this uh, reduction of exposed inequality uh, across uh, different households when we switch from optimal rank policy to optimal hand policy. So just to conclude, so in this project, I study the, uh, how the redistributive channels of inflation is going to affect the design of optimal monetary policy. So I find that, you know, in this hand model, uh, from the perspective of a utilitarian uh, central bank, the optimal monetary policy should be uh, asymmetric. It's accommodative to inflation, but very aggressive mm -hmm. against uh, deflation. So here, uh, so this is mostly driven by this revaluation channel and also earnings channel, and which benefits, which makes inflation more beneficial to the low-income households through nominal debt devaluation and also through the driven their higher earnings growth. So the, the, the framework I, I provide in this exercise is general enough to allow for you know, many different uh, future extensions, including uh, you know, more thinking through this additional channels of real asset to think about different types of shots and also thinking about optimal monetary policy rule design where we have different assumptions on fiscal policy. And uh, so just to put it in my in my bigger uh, agenda, so I, I have also been, so beside this work, I have also been uh, trying to thinking about to develop, develop uh, like new uh, new quantitative methods to study uh, this, you know, Hank models in sort of a global solution uh, perspective. So which allows us not only can study sort of the, the local optimal policy to some shocks that hit the steady state or to compare different steady states. So, but also allow us to study optimal monetary policy or optimal monetary physical policy in sort of the stochastic steady state. You know, it's like a global solution to a model with aggregate shock repeatedly hits the economy. So uh, in some other work I have been using, you know, this uh, developing this, you know, deep learning based method to solve this classical model. And I'm also uh, uh, trying to incorporate in this deep learning method to this optimal exercise uh, in a more uh, global framework. Thanks so much. Ben, do you want to leave the, the micro? I have mine here, but no, you leave it on there. Thanks. Cool. Uh, okay. Thanks, everyone, for for being here. Um, so yeah, let me let me briefly discuss. Uh, what, uh, let me briefly discuss uh, YouTube paper. I mean, this is this is a very interesting, and I think uh, with lots of potential paper. Um, in a nutshell, briefly summarizing what he's doing here. So, in terms of empirics, he he kind of using up to date data. He reevaluates three redistributive channels of inflation, um, like the, the expanded to channel, what we it's been called expenditure in the quality of consumption channel, in, in which a low and middle income uh, household is been in high inflation after a monetary policy shock. I mean, this is this comes from the fact that. Um, uh, consumption baskets of different households vary uh, across different dimensions of, of, of uh, households characteristics. Then about the revaluation channel, uh, and where, where basically he and the literature has found that lower and middle income uh, are net nominal borrowers. I'm going to come back to, to this part of low and, and, and middle income households. Uh, and then about I mean the, the third uh, the third channel that he kind of uh, revises empirically he's going to have in his model is the earnings in earning channels where low and, and high income uh, households tend to have more sensitive earnings to different uh, aggregate conditions and and, and uh, Yucheng here tests uh, um, the correlation with uh, aggregate output employment but also also inflation and then he he goes to a structural model a hang type with first two sectors and different uh, with different nominal rigidities 
plus household uh, non homotetic preferences. This is what this gives him is this uh, heterogeneity consumption baskets ac across the income uh, distribution and uh, a, a different uh, reaction of, of relative prices to, to, to shocks. Uh, given the, the two different uh, nominal rigidities in the in the sections, then he's having saving and borrowing in one period nominal bond, uh, which allows him to uh, actually analyze this revaluation channel of uh, where nominal assets and liabilities change value with with uh, real value with inflation, and then uh, essentially he has either syncretic irony shocks with heterogeneity in the sensitivity to aggregate conditions. This is kind of something relatively new in in this literature. Uh, and this allows him to capture these uh, kind of earn, what, what he calls the earnings channel, which essentially ha it means uh, the, the earnings of different households across the income distribution varying differently with, with aggregate shocks. And so uh, three, three main results. And uh, when he looks at uh, optimal non-linear uh, non Taylor rules around the steady state after a demand shock, uh, is important. The first result is this Taylor rule, optimal Taylor rule is asymmetric, uh, mainly due to the revelation and earnings channel. The second result is uh, when we move from the optimal tailor in a rank to optimal tailor in a hang within his benchmark framework, uh, this improves things, especially for the low and middle income. And then the third result, you cannot see here, but I mean, he didn't talk much about this today, so I'm not going to enter much into this. Is I mean, when you decompose this, this relatively relative gain from moving from one, one optimal tailor route to the other one, uh, this comes from uh, a better insurance uh, and a reduction in, in inequality. So let me put this in context. So to, and, and I think this is this comes uh, in hand with, uh, with given uh, Fernanda's presentation before. When what when we think about welfare cost of inflation, I like to think about this in two two different two different ways. Although I mean these are not uh, these are not uh, exclusive one from the other, but. Uh, we can think about welfare costs of, of uh, unexpected inflation emerging from uh, redistribution between individuals with different monetary uh, marginal propensity to consume and, and heterogeneous balance sheet. Uh, usually, uh, and, and I like to think about this uh, unexpected inflation shock as, as perceived to be temporary. There's a, a pretty recent empirical uh, work done uh, uh, on this. Uh, Gonzalo and Gotos have some, some work. We also have, uh, just given some publicity, we have some some uh, work here, as, goes, as Fernando was mentioning, uh, at least our, our work here is more on the accounting side. So what happens on impact after a, a, a completely unexpected inflationary shock? And this paper, the interesting thing here is that Yuchen builds a very nice structure where you can actually uh, analyze uh, both the, the effect on impact, but also what happens on the transition uh, on a perfect course, a nonlinear transition, uh, when, when this shock is perceived and actually be, is uh, temporary. And then we have another strand where essentially um, that looks at, at expected inflation instead, or, or more than expected long run inflation in steady state or permanent change in inflation in steady state. And this is Fernando's paper here. Uh, uh, usually this has been looked in, in, in rank models. So Fernando's is a, is a nice contribution. And the main, the main uh, usually the, 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 let's say, one on one uh, welfare cost of inflation uh, emphasized in these kind of environments comes from the fact that. Uh, when there's fluctuation, when there's nominal rigidities, there's a, there's an a, a, a equilibrium, a, a dispersion a, a, a in relative prices emerges, and this uh, essentially fluctuates away from the optima, uh, and it, it generates incorrect signals uh, uh, relative to the cost of production. So there's a loss in efficiency here. And the interesting thing is that in the in the standard rank uh, sticky price models, this uh, let's say this. Welfare costs are huge. I mean, for me, are kind of unrealistically big. So essentially, like I wouldn't stay, so they, they have a paper in, in 2018 where if you move to zero, from zero to 12% inflation in steady state, this generates a 10% consumption equivalent uh, loss uh, coming from this particular channel, which is very different from what the, the channel that Fernando's emphasized before. So, okay, let's fo focus now on, on, on Eugene's paper. So uh, there are a couple of things that I found very interesting that, I, I mean, uh, okay, so so let me. This is uh, essentially going back to the to the first kind of unexpected and perceived to be trans transitory shocks. This is I'm plotting here, like in the case of Spain, this is the inflation shock in Spain 2021, uh, and and this is what I'm plotting is the ECB's. I like to plot and show this this graph quite a bit. So this is uh, ECB's uh, projections two year ahead or, or on two year ahead inflation, uh, for, and these are forecasts for, for Spain. So if you stand in 
uh, December 2020, the projections for 2021 and 2022 were actually much lower, even lower than 2% from what, compared to what actually happened, which is the solid solid line here. And if you stood in the middle of 2021, uh, again, the projections uh, were about this shock to be uh, actually quite temporary. The perception was that the shock was going to be very temporary. Uh, this is more about the same, but now in, in addition to these CD projections, I'm, I'm showing you a projection or expectations from consumers, inflation link swap, survey of professional forecast. And the idea is the same. The perception in December 2020 for 2021 was much lower one than the realized inflation, which was 6.6%. And the, the, it was perceived to be temporary. If you stood in June 2021, the perception for end of 2021 and 2022 was much lower than the realized, right? So in terms of the paper, I think, I mean, taking all this to, into account, uh, uh, there are a couple of things that I, I find uh, interesting that, and I think that uh, they, they, they deserve a lot of uh, much work. So as I was saying before, uh, here, I mean, you have a, a very nice setup in which you could actually distinguish and quantify the world per cost that comes from this discussion that, that arose after Fernando's presentation. The first is, what happens on impact, this kind of accounting exercise of given, given the distribution of households in steady state, what, what's the impact for them, given that you're considering a, a zero probability event here from the point of view of household, this is a completely unexpected shock, but what happens on impact? This is kind of the accounting exercise that Fernando was mentioning. And then you can actually look at what happens in the transition. And actually, I, I think there's a, a lot of room to, to say something more about what happens with uh, adjustments by, by household. So what what happened? Where where does the the, the welfare cost that, that you compute on, on the optimal policy rule? Uh, how much of that comes from the fact that households um, start households start to to adjust uh, to adjust their uh, their portfolio, uh, but also the consumption expenditures. Um, so again, this is kind of also the second point. So. Uh, and in the data, you actually look account for this shift in consumption baskets, but I don't see that in the model. And I, I think uh, it, it is there, but it's hidden. And right now, I mean, the way I, I think, at least the way I read the model, is kind of is kind of hidden. Uh, and related to that, uh, in the in the in the data, you estimate the elasticity of earnings with respect to uh, inflation and output. But then in the model, you only use aggregate output uh, in, ter in terms of. Uh, modeling the, the, the elasticity. So you don't include, uh, you don't model the elasticity with respect to inflation. So I, I don't know why, why, why is that? Uh, at this point on the revaluation chain, again, uh, it's, it comes back to this uh, on impact and transition. I think it would be very interesting to look at what happens uh, to these uh, portfolio adjustments uh, of household. You only have one one asset here, right? But 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 still, I think uh, it, it, it's something to think about. And then the last thing in, in this in this issue of the nature of the shock, uh, I think it would be interesting to compare this to what happens in, in a supply side kind of shock, where inflation and output move in different directions. You lose the kind of these um, divine coincidence in terms of monetary policy. And I think in terms of the the optimal optimal policy rule, uh, the, how it compares to the case of a demand shock. I think it's something easy to to do, and and it would be it would be very very informative. So in terms of the nonlinear Taylor rule that you showed, um, thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Okay. So I, I talked a bit about this. Uh, so uh, there, there's one thing that that for me was a bit funny, which is the bounce on on the on the on the rule on the search of the news. So this this there's to me there's something numerical here in the sense that. You're hitting the bound, uh, which is uh, arbitrary. So, in a sense, uh, I think uh, I mean I, I would try to expand. Maybe we try this. We we'll try to expand this and see what happens because these these three uh, exercises where you shut down each channel at one at a time, the the this the optimal uh, deflationary could change a bit, uh, and and also this actually changes the behavior in steady state, right? Because you're estimating the the model in steady state. Uh, so yeah, just let me let me wrap up with this uh, other thing that I found quite funny. So you you showed you showed uh, the the welfare gain uh, of optimal of using uh, the optimal uh, monetary policy <laughs> model, and then when when you show the comparison of what happens when moving from the rank optimal policy and to the hang uh, optimal policy, to me there's here I don't I don't see so you showed that the the, the, main, the main winners is the bottom twenty five percent of income. Uh, of the income distribution, but then all the other rest, all the, the rest of the households along the asset distribution, they, if I understand correctly, they lose when you move from the rank to the hand. So where does this overall gain come from? 
so how many households do you have? I mean, I hear you're dividing uh, across the, the quantiles of the income, but there's something I, I try, I, maybe I'm, I'm missing something, which I think would be would be useful to clarify. So yeah, let me, let me finish there. Um, and uh, so if you wanna, yeah, so, yeah, thanks so much for this uh, excellent discussion. I think it's not a uh, very important point. So let me uh, quickly respond to this and then I can, your, your point, then I can pick some questions. So first of all, you know, this, uh, uh, so there are some people like who lose from this policy change, but overall the, the welfare is, is improved. Uh, so this, even the policy loss is very large, but it's only a very small share of density that are uh, here. And also overall, so this, this this magnitude is sort of larger than these and these. So which means uh, the middle income is a loser. Uh, a loser sorry. Yeah, the middle income are slightly loose from this policy change, but overall the workers, the aggregate work, so the, the aggregate social worker is, is improved. So this is the first point. And uh, yeah, I think so 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 so, so the I actually tried this optimal uh, uh, Taylor rule against uh, uh, this inflation in a much larger range and the coefficient both about like 100, 200. So which is not a very sensible result. It's actually similar to what uh, Shmi and Grohe Uribe uh, compute in their uh, optimal rank paper. So I guess that's why finally people think, well, maybe three is gonna be a reasonably large upper bound for this kind of exercise. Then we just do put, put a bound here. <laughs> Let's put a bound here. Okay. so. Uh, yeah, I think I think all these uh, points about uh, you know uh, uh, expected and unexpected inflation, and also about this expenditure uh, and also portfolio adjustment, uh, is is very uh, interesting. I think for the expenditure share, actually, I, I have the expenditure uh, uh, channel. I actually try to see you know how what what the what the the, the change in terms of the, the consumption basket is going to play a role in here. But because I think the current uh, my current setup. Uh, of modeling this expenditure channel is using this generalized strong Gary uh, form of non homothetic preference, which cannot, uh, which does not allow the expenditure shift to play a, a very large role here. So that's uh, why it's not a here yet. Okay. Yes, I can. It's a very interesting project. So when you go to the welfare model, you have the proper analysis. Mm -hmm. My question is, there are these new number of projects run by Eduardo Davila and Andres now and another by Tom Sarsh and uh, and Mall and Walker. Yeah. They really want to really think about a very similar environment. I think they, they compose the welfare game, like they've been able to contribute into efficiency, but yes. Yes. So my specific question is, given that you are aware of this project, is try to apply those methods to your project and what I will talk about that. Oh, so uh, actually, so when we write those papers, different people are using, different groups are using different uh, formulation of this uh, welfare uh, again decomposition. So I'm following this uh, Bonabu floating you know, more classical way to do that. But I think the main, like the main results are similar. It's mostly come, so these welfare again are mostly coming from this redistribution component instead of providing more insurance or improving the efficiency. Uh, but I think so. I think they do different type of methods, but there's three thousand. Yeah, I think it would be nice to try to apply the other method as well and see if you have the similar answer. Of, yes, yes. Given that you have to have the machine. Yeah. Right. <laughs> question. Sorry about the the welfare function. When you set this sky positive, you know the welfare mm -hmm. cost of inflation uh, comes a little bit kind of I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, in the micro founded gender model, simple one. The reason we care about inflation is because we generate price dispersion and price dispersion has uh, consequences for allocation. So here it seems that you would get something similar from the first term, right? I mean, misallocation because of price uh, dispersion. So why are you? Oh, so first of all, I think it's 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 worth on that the new Keynesian models cannot capture that much of the worker cost of inflation. So that's something that I think people have been reading a lot. So that is why there has been a lot of uh, papers uh, trying to use other kind of framework like the money search framework to think about why we should hate the inflation that much. And I'm essentially cal calibrate this kind by borrowing from the sum of the odds from that literature. So that's a, 
Yeah. I mean, but uh, well, you don't have charge, so. Right, so that's that's sort of what I'm. So that's sort of uh, something that I do. So we cannot have a new Keynesian model, but I try to put it here uh, as why the why the central bank uh, emphasized price stabilization so much, which cannot be captured in the new Keynesian framework. So just using this kind yeah. of. But actually, your discussion just said that it's caught in a typical yeah. framework. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 what I was mentioning, so we need to talk to your course again. He, again, he actually has a in, the, in his recent like up to monetary policy. He also mentioned that we cannot generate enough worker costs, but this is something that we can talk but about. Think, yeah. So I think in that case, so. I don't know. I don't think they have uh, sticky price and neo-Keynesian features in that paper in Gallus. Uh, uh, or I, I'm, I'm, if, if we're talking about the same. So the, the, when you have in the in the usual brand as representative agent with with no, one sector, we mentioned in the in the global sense. That's not trend inflation. Yeah, very high trend inflation. But I also want to mention another point that so in the paper I also. Yeah. You uh, so solve the problem with chi equals to zero. This also gives yeah, me exactly. that. So that was the question. Basically. Yeah, this also gives me an asymmetric of the monetary policy. But the essential result is the all the solutions are going to be called corner solution. So all the monetary policy response to inflation is going to be at the left boundary, so which is the uh, you know, determinants of bottom. Yeah. Yes. Or um, or okay, sorry. Inflation. What would the planner do in the new model? So the, the planner, the planner is going to set the uh, yeah. The planner is going to set the optimal monetary policy following the last line uh, as a as a as a pivot. Yeah. So also about this inflation stuff that. So one reason that we might have a more, you know, higher inflation, optimal inflation, mm -hmm. is that because of zero bond, so people want to, you know, avoid the zero bond. Mm -hmm. So we might have a higher inflation, you know, than otherwise implied by the UK model. And that's yeah. one, sure. one thing. The other thing is when you yeah. like justify your sophistication by alluding to mm -hmm. such a model, I'm not expert in such a model, but in such model, typically Friedman mode is optimal. So you actually optimize deflation is the, you know, you don't you don't have like pi t star, pi t scale, you pi t minus something, and then something is negative because they're in that kind of model, which is optimized typically Friedman will which is you know targets negative inflation. Okay, so I think for, for your first point, I think that's a very interesting point. So this is also something we can do when we have a global solution methods to these hang models, because we actually don't have much machinery to do that, uh, so that we can handle things away from steady state, like zero or one. I think, yeah, for the, for the, for the second point, uh, uh, for, for some, I, I'm not sure about, I'm not sure about this. this yeah, there's a thing that from years ago, it's rejected by the world. I think it's kind of, okay, standard, you can get more optimized zero inflation, because of the new here is this uh, price exporter, right? From sticky price. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, typical, like, such a model actually is right negative inflation because it's a lead manual is up, you know. I see. So I they mix the, you know, not some kind of, you know, you can tell model with some such feature. Yeah, I think on, on top of that, I want to I, I want to say, so I think one thing that we learn from this, uh, you know, this hang kind of literature is that inflation is going to have more is more benefit. We, we, we do have more benefits from inflation because of this distributed effects. So all this, uh, all this redistribute, uh, re 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 evaluation and also earnings channel. I guess this is something that drives us to have a higher level of optimal inflation. Okay, I think we're out of time. So thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, to the Banco de España for including our paper in the program. This joint work with. Philip Snotfeil, Andreas Hackertal, who are in Frankfurt, it's actually perfect to come right after these uh, two previous papers, because pretty much what we try to do in this paper is actually like empirically evaluating like to the extent to which people actually even are aware of kind of this normal re-evaluation channel, like how they react when they receive information about it, and ultimately with a kind of this re-evaluation of the perceived and expected real network ultimately then matters for their consumption decisions in survey and actual consumption data, but also potentially then in hypothetical choices of how to finance a house 
either with a fixed uh, trust rate or kind of with equity. And so like, you know, you know, for example, for Mina's work that people don't like inflation because they expect actually like higher uh, prices will not feed one-to-one -one into like their nominal wages. But like, you know, as we now just learned that you know, potentially there's also this pretty important uh, redistribution channel from like, you know, if you have a surprise inflation from uh, people that have a large net nominal position on the asset side to people that have a large nominal position on the debt side. And so like, you know, while this uh, redistribution channel is potentially quite uh, strong and powerful, like, you know, I would say it's kind of uh, fair to evaluate that you know, on the empirical side, besides Stefan and Schneider, that just assume that everyone is aware of it. And then there's this redistribution with very little kind of empirical evidence of whether people even understand that kind of their nominal assets and liabilities actually kind of uh, gain or lose in real uh, value when they actually have unexpected inflation. Pot potentially could be because like, you know, they are not, have a money illusion or potentially like, you know, this direct effect of revaluation and consumption choices might be muted because maybe people have a low marginal propensity to uh, consume out of unrealized, let's say, uh, capital gains. Like imagine now I have a fixed um, mortgage outstanding. Now we have unexpected inflation. So like, you know, the reliability goes down. But so like, if I don't adjust now, because like, you know, there's not a realized uh, gain in my wealth, I might actually not see any change in household action. And so like, what we want to do is we'll serve an information provision experiment. First kind of like, you know, learn a little bit to which extent people are aware of like this re-evaluation channels, then we actually want to actually provide information about this re-evaluation both on the asset side and the liability side. We do that in a randomized fashion. Subsequently, we elicit people's perceived and expected real net wealth changes. And then at the end, we want to see whether those changes in perceived uh, real uh, wealth actually transmit into planned spending in the survey, planned uh, housing and leverage choice, but then also through like, you know, administrative bank data into actual consumption spending. And so like, you know, in terms of like big pictures, so like what we do find, so like ex ante before on our information provision, people actually are really well aware that like, you know, if you have fixed uh, savings, nominal savings, like unexpected inflation is bad for you. So like they are part of this part of the re-evaluation channel on the asset side. Instead, actually, if you ask them like, you know, is a fixed rate mortgage kind of a good hedge against unexpected inflation? They're actually the knowledge is substantially more muted. Then we actually tell them in the simple calculation. I show that how we do that. Actually, this re-evaluation of nominal assets and nominal liabilities. Subsequently, we see that indeed, because people on average are pretty well informed, they react uh, pretty little to like the asset side, but actually there's substantial update in the perceived real net worth for people that actually have uh, higher net no, uh, uh, negative net normal positions, so like have a large um, uh, mortgages, let's say outstanding. And then we show that ultimately this transmits into spending. And in terms of like back of the envelope calculation, you see like MPCs out of unrealized kind of net worth changes of about three cents on the dollar. So like in line with kind of some of the literature. Okay, so like, let me now tell you a little bit how we actually implemented that. So like last year, we cooperated with a large uh, blue bank in Germany that shall go unnamed. And so like what we did, so like, you know, we kind of, uh, uh, the bank on our behalf kind of sent out survey invitation to their customers. Who did we contact? Everyone that has a mortgage outstanding with the bank and everyone that has kind of uh, transaction data for like their consumption that is categorized. And so we got like in July of last year and about 4,000 respondents, the average response or the median response time was 18 minutes. So people spent quite a bit of time on the provided information. And then from the bank, we have like, you know, on the one hand, some basic demographics, but crucially also for the paper, we do know kind of like the income aggregation feature from the bank, the transactions they undertake, but also like some of the household balance uh, sheet kind of statistics. So here, just actually to bring home the point, like our sample is like positively selected in the sense that customers of these banks in general, in particular, however, also like the people that participate in our survey, are more educated relative to the average German population. They are more likely to uh, have a, a house, so like the average home ownership rate in Germany is more like 43, 44%. They're more likely to hold stocks. The average uh, direct ownership is more like 20% in the average population. And they do have substantial nominal positions on their balance sheet, both on the asset side and on the liability side as a fraction of their gross wealth. 
They're also actually pretty well informed about the prevailing inflation rate. So at the time we did the survey, they actually pretty much on average hit exactly what current inflation was. And they're also pretty concerned in terms of how inflation might affect uh, their overall uh, balance sheet. So like on average, like, you know, those are people that are pretty well informed about prevailing inflation. They're concerned about the effect on their net worth, but also like on average, uh, highly educated. Okay, so then, you know, in terms of like uh, the survey, what did we do at the very beginning? First kind of elicit some prior expectations, how inflation over the last 12 months affected their net worth, but then also like, you know, to which extent they think that, you know, certain assets provide a hedge against unexpected inflation. Then we just randomly split our survey population in three uh, groups, a control group, and I told you in a second what information they see, then like a treatment group for loans, a treatment group for uh, normal assets. And then subsequently we elicit again their perceived uh, real net worth changes, bland and hypothetical consumption and real estate choices. And then like, you know, we also can link the actual consumption through like this uh, income aggregation feature from the bank. So here I'm just showing you like now the treatment information for the long group. So here, first of all, we tell them what the prevailing inflation rate is, what that means for kind of uh, expenses. But then also like, you know, we uh, uh, have a simple calculation where you tell them, look, imagine you now actually take out a loan for year maturity, and then unexpectedly now actually inflation went up to 8.7% and stays high until the end of the loan. You know, if the, here we follow Dr. Schneider, subsequently we assume that there's no more inflation exposure. If you actually kind of like took out the loan a year ago and the value of $50,000, you know, the value has dropped in real terms to $38,800. And we do have a link in the survey where people can actually see the calculation behind that number. And then, so like, you know, we directly say like, you know, if you are kind of an, uh, a borrower, that's kind of like positive news for you. Then kind of for the um, asset side of the treatment, very symmetric first, what is prevailing inflation? What does it mean for expenditure? And then also like, you know, imagine you have like a three-year savings product you invested in last year. And then again, you have unexpected inflation. The real value of your savings product actually went down by the same amount as on the loan side. And again, it's bad news for savers. And then like in the control group, you know, we wanted to make sure that everyone knows what the current inflation rate is. So we told them the current inflation rate. And so therefore now we can actually then study how people adjust their perceived net uh, worth in response to the treatment relative to the control group, to kind of get rid of kind of pure inflation effects, but then see how kind of this re-evaluation channel is potentially operative. Okay, so like here, just to show you a little bit kind of in terms of like ex ante before information provision, how well were people informed about this normal re-evaluation channel. So here we ask people, you know, in terms of like, you know, hedge against unexpected inflation, how would you rate different asset classes? A really good hedge, a really poor hedge in dark black, let's focus on savings. And then like in light gray, let's focus on fixed rate loans. What you see is like, you know, people are really aware of that, you know, unexpected inflation is really bad if you have fixed nominal savings. So like, you know, very poor or poor rating. Instead, actually like in light gray, you know, there's a chunk of people that is aware of that, like having a fixed, let's say mortgage, actually provides some hedge, but the fraction of those people is substantially lower relative to the informedness for fixed uh, nominal savings. Okay, so now what I want to show you is actually the effect of our information provision on kind of like outcomes. And first, I want to see how people rate now the kind of the inflation hedge and properties of these different assets once they receive information relative to the control group and subsequently study the perceived and expected real net worth changes. And so like the specification is like, you know, depending on the table you're looking at some outcome variable elicited after the information provision, unlike treatment dummies relative to the control group, we directly condition a rich set of observables, which is know from the bank, but also their prior perceived real net worth change over the last 12 months. Okay, so like, how do we now uh, look at those tables? So like, you know, if you learn that, you know, your savings actually lose for like 12,000 euros in value because of unexpected inflation, you now wait actually uh, the, the inflation protection properties of nominal assets 
uh, more negatively relative to the control group and in terms of magnitudes, those are standardized, you know, 12, 13% of a standard deviation less positively relative to someone who is in the control group. Instead, if you now look at the effects of like learning about the erosion of your nominal liabilities, here now actually now you rate kind of nominal debt as having a better inflation protection property. That's about like 20% of a standard deviation. And then there's also in general kind of like some updating in terms of like how you rate, for example, different assets. So we have a question on debt aversion. The Germans are kind of notorious and that they don't like that. And so we elicit in the survey to which extent they think actually taking out debt is a good idea. And you do see actually learning about this loan erosion, they become less debt averse. So like, you know, again, not only like how you rate the assets in terms of like kind of inflation hedging, but also in general views about their properties. One thing I also want to mention, there's very little cross-learning in the sense that if I tell people that now nominal liabilities are worth less in real terms, you could think maybe they also kind of can understand that like nominal assets are kind of bad, but you see there's very little cross-learning here, at least not statistically, and here is the fact, you know, there's marginal kind of cross-learning uh, over here. Okay. Now what I want to do is kind of now focus on like how these information treatments actually affect people's perceived and expected change in real net worth due to unexpected inflation. So we ask them, you know, how much do you think actually your real net worth has changed over the last 12 months as a function of unexpected inflation? How much will it actually change going forward over the next 12 months? It's the second set of three columns and then like the sum of the two together. And so like, you know, we saw previously people ex ante are poorly informed about kind of the loan erosion part at least of our treatments. And so here you see once they learn actually like, you know, the unexpected inflation is good for them, they actually now update already their perceived real net worth as a function of like over the last 12 months upwards, like also the expected one, but it's not statistically significant. But once you actually look at the two jointly, so like the perceived and expected real net worth change after the treatment relative to before, and relative to households in the control group, you see the update like the perceived real net worth by about three percentage points, which is actually quite sizable. It's about like 50% of like the movement in the control groups, so, like overall, it's a pretty big number. Instead, like, you know, we saw people on average are better informed about the savings erosion part. And here you do see indeed, like, you know, they don't update much to the information because ex ante, they were more likely to be aware of it. This is now with OLS. Uh, these type of surveys, oftentimes, you know, there's lots of noise, rounding, heaping, and stuff like that. So to partially at least tackle that, you know, sometimes people use some form of robust regression. This is from like Uber robust regressions. And so what, what we see here is like, you know, point estimates are pretty similar, but now we actually have a bit more statistical power. They're more precisely estimated. And now you see that if I learn that, you know, kind of savings and fixed normal assets is bad for me, then I actually also just down what's my expected perceived real net worth change relative to before learning that and people in the control group. Okay, so like now, of course, you know, we saw in the previous two papers, there's lots of heterogeneity in people's net nominal positions. So like ex ante, you would expect that also the treatment effect should vary potentially based on how exposed people are to these different mechanisms in general. So what I'm plotting here now on the x-axis, just the net nominal position as a function of gross wealth. So here, a large negative net nominal position. Here to the far right, a large positive net nominal position, meaning effectively you have a large fixed layer rate mortgage that's there outstanding here. And here you save a lot in terms of nominal assets. And what you see here is like, you know, the reevaluation of like the perceived and expected net worth is substantially more positive if you have a large negative net nominal position relative to having a positive net normal position. And like, you know, there's also some heterogeneity, but not nearly as stark for like the asset side of the treatment. Okay, perfect. Okay, so like, first of all, like, you know, limited awareness for the loan part, distance transmits and expected and perceived real net worth changes. Now what we want to understand, do those perceived and expected changes in real net worth transmits into planned and actual consumption expenditure and so that's now the last part that I cover in the last five minutes. So here, this is now first in the survey. You know, how much do you plan to spend over the next four weeks relative to the previous four weeks, more the same or less on different categories, like, you know, groceries, 
restaurants, leisure, clothing, and durables. And of course, like, you know, just because I now learn I'm a little bit richer or poorer, I might not actually cut down on my muesli consumption. So therefore, like, you know, staples which are need uh, for surviving, you know, you wouldn't expect any uh, effect. And indeed, like, you know, relative to the previous four weeks and the next four weeks, you do not adjust your planned spending for groceries. But, you know, once I learned that actually I'm richer but because of the loan treatment, and here we focus on the loan treatment, because this was the only one that actually affected uh, people's perceptions and expectations. You know, I'm more likely to go to restaurants and have some fun. And like, you know, there's no change in uh, buying doorbells and uh, uh, clothing. So like here in a reduced form, just, you know, planning to spend more, same or less next four weeks relative to previous four weeks. If I learned, uh, just learn about this loan erosion treatment, I'm spending more on stuff where potentially I can easily adjust intertemporally my spending allocation. Okay, so then, you know, what I will now want to do is potentially to see whether it's actually causal link. This was just reduced form. So now what I want to do, I want to now instrument the change in perceived and expected net worth after the treatment relative to before. The instrument that with my treatment dummy. And then I want to see whether the instrumented or the exogenous part of this uh, expected and perceived real net worth change matters in for uh, people's uh, spending views, but also their actual spending in the bank data, keeping constant their prior real net worth change, and again, having some control variables in terms of demographics and other categories. Okay, so like, you know, similar what we saw before, like again, like, you know, this is no more cost of setting, people still don't spend their change their groceries, but you know, now here you see in terms of uh, treatment effects says like, you know, if I learn about that uh, my real net worth change is one percentage point higher, you know, I'm about uh, 0 0.4 uh, percentage point more like this is now stated it's a good time. I am uh, spending more in the next four weeks relative to the previous four weeks. And this is now actual consumption spending because like, you know, one concern is like people might say all kind of stuff in surveys, but to which extent does it actually transmit into actual behavior and so like what we are doing here we go to the bank and use their kind of categorized spending data it's like similar to mint.com it's kind of an income aggregator across different accounts you can see like based on like mastercard categories let's say on what they spend their money and so like we do some categorization like total spending non-discretionary spending and discretionary spending 30 days, 60 days, 90 days after like the survey relative to 30, 60 and 90 days before the survey. And what you see here first again in this reduced form setup, you know, are you in the treatment group for loans? You do spend about like, you know, up to $200 more or euros in this case, if you learn about the loan erosion treatment relative to not learning it in the control group. And you see like pretty much it's concentrated in the discretionary part as classified by the bank it kind of makes sense and again like you know if you do that in a kind of more causal setting instrumenting the perceived real net worth change due to our kind of treatment you see like now you know one percentage point higher perceived real net worth translates into like 92 dollars higher spending largely in the discretionary part and like you know this translates into an mdpc due to our treatment of around three percent which kind of is similar in magnitude, for example, what kind of letter Ludwigsen estimate in the AER paper in 2004, or like Marco Di Maggio out of unrealized capital gains in their uh, kind of, I think they use Swedish data for that. So like, you know, the magnitudes are not super, super big, but economically plausible. So the last uh, minute or so we have, like, you know, we're going to see whether this potentially also matters in how people kind of, you know, uh, which type of houses people want to purchase and how they want to finance these houses. This is again going back to the survey, purely survey based. Like, you know, imagine like you could now purchase a house. You can actually use up to 500,000 in equity, 500,000 in loans. You know, how big of a house do you want to purchase? How you want to finance it at that equity? And do you want to use fixed versus adjustable rate mortgages? And so, like, what you see here, like, in terms of like, learning about loan erosion doesn't really lead to you buying a bigger house, at least not statistically. But what you see is like, you know, you use more debt to do so, your leverage ratio goes up, and you're also more likely to use a fix relative to a just fluid mortgage relative to the same choices for people in the control group. And so like, uh, let me wrap up. And so like, you know, what we try to do in this paper is kind of 
understand and document the extent to which people are aware of this kind of re-evaluation channel due to unexpected inflation. We do see that actually, at least when it comes to the nominal debt side, people are actually pretty unaware of that. Then when they learn about it, they update their perceived and expected real net worth change. And then ultimately this transmits into planned and extra consumption data. And so like, you know, for us at least, uh, you know, it's pretty much work in focus. This tends to suggest that actually like, you know, perceived real net worth matters for how people kind of make savings consumption decisions. But, you know, there's also potentially a mutual effect, at least a direct effect of this re-evaluation because a big chunk of the people are not aware of it. Thank you. We have uh, Paola discussing. Okay, so um, thanks a lot for the opportunity of discussing this paper. Um, it's super interesting. Here's the usual disclaimer. Um, well, I should also give another disclaimer. I'm, um, I'm a theory person. I'm a flexible prices person. So bear with me, you know, with my, with my comments. Um, so here's, of course, um, you know, the presentation of the paper was very good. So there's not much need of um, presenting the, the results again, but here's a brief summary of, of my understanding of, of the paper. So of course there are many papers that document the redistributive effects of unexpected inflation. And this is a paper about unexpected inflation. I wanna say there are also many papers that talk about the redistributive effects of expected inflation. And this paper is not about that. Now, this paper is about whether households are aware of these effects and um, does awareness of these effects affect their beliefs of their real wealth? And if it does, then how are their uh, consumption decisions and financial decisions affected by this, uh, by this awareness? And the super interesting part for me is that the authors have access to transaction data so they can actually also see how their informational treatments affect consumption decisions, uh, actual consumption decisions. So, you know, this is a survey conducted in Germany on bank customers, about 4,000 bank customers. Uh, there's a treatment, um, there's inf an informational treatment, there's a control group that doesn't, that only receives information about inflation. Um, one treatment group that receives information about the debt erosion channel of unexpected inflation and one that receives information about the um, savings erosion channel of unexpected inflation. Um, now, the main findings are, in, in my view, are about the debt erosion channel. Okay, that's the, the authors find that there's limited knowledge of that channel. Um, in their survey participants. Um, and once um, people receive information about uh, the debt erosion channel, this affects their beliefs on their real net wealth, and it affects um, both hypothetical consumption and financial decisions, but also actual consumption decisions. Now, in terms of my comments, so, um, as Michael said, there um, the the survey participants seem to be, you know, high uh, high education. Um, I would have liked to know more about the survey participants. Um, their my understanding is that the income comes from the from the bank data. Um, so in the table about demographics, there is information about income. I would like to know: Are these high income individuals? Um, they seem to be high education. Do you have any information about, you know, can you tell us more about their exposure to liquid assets, illiquid assets and so on? So you ask them about that. Do you have any data about that? Um, 
And so, and that leads to the further question. So how representative is this sample? Okay. So for example, one of the findings is that um, once the, you know, if they receive this informational treatments, this doesn't really seem to uh, affect their, um, their spending in groceries, for example, or their discretionary spending in general. Um, does it matter? I would think it matters if they are high income. Um, can you um, reweight the sur the you know the survey data to get some um, you know to see if results differ across the income distribution? Now redistribution. Okay, so um, so in the abstract, in the introduction, throughout the paper, the authors talk about. Um, how their paper contributes, I mean, to, um, to our understanding of the um, redistributive effects of unexpected inflation, and, um, and it certainly does. But I think also in light of the, of the comments to the previous papers, this is one channel, right? This is one redistributive channel from, um, from savers to debtors, right? The debtors are better off, the savers are, are worse off because of unexpected inflation. So I think the paper contributes to the understanding to, to whether, you know, to whether German households understand really the existence of, of this channel and whether they, um, um, and whether they react to it. So I'm wondering if, if these findings can then, you know, how, how can then, how can they contribute to our assessment of the redistributive effects of inflation. Um, and so for this, you, you, you might need a model, but can the findings of, the, of, of this paper be used um, um, you know, to enrich the types of models that, that, um, that we saw before? Because as we saw in the comments, you know, people have different ideas about uh, um, whether inflation is a, um, a regressive or a progressive tax, so can, you know, can, can understanding about um, of, whether households are aware or not of these channels can it can it enrich this um, our understanding of that? Um, and then, I mean, I guess the things with with survey uh, papers is that you always have questions about the questions in the survey, and the survey already took place, so I don't know how um, how useful this is, but. Um, well, actually, here I say in the treatment section, that is both in the control and in the treatment. So you tell the participants, right, that this is the highest uh, uh, inflation rate in more than thirty, in more than seventy years in Germany. So I'm, I'm wondering why you need to tell them that. So why do you need to kind of lead them? To, so isn't telling them the inflation rate enough? I'm wondering, did you do some pretests where they? Um, where, where he understood that maybe just telling them the number was not enough and you really need to make them understand that this is this is a high inflation rate. Um, and also, and here, so this comment may, maybe is related to the types of models I'm, I'm used to that are more about expected inflation. So if, if your participants enter already knowing what the inflation rate is, right? Because they seem to, to really know uh, what the inflation rate was in you know in 2022 when you conducted the survey to the to the first digit. So they really need to seem to be well informed. Um, so why for a saver, why is that unexpected inflation? Right? Wouldn't they have already adjusted to the to the higher inflation rate? And so and, and so I'm wondering if that so if I were to write a model of expected inflation, savers would adjust to the expected inflation. There would be no effect on nominal savings, basically, in, in, in real terms. So could the weakness on the, um, on the savings erosion channel be due to the fact that actually that inflation is not, for them, is not unexpected, but is actually expected? I'm not sure if that um, the way I said it made uh, much sense. But... Okay, so um, I find this um, the paper fascinating, in particular the fact that you could um, 
you know, that, that you had access also to the transaction data and see how the information um, treatment also affected their actual consumption. Um, I would have loved to know more about the um, about the respondents' demographic characteristics and whether um, the results have you know would change if we were to look at, for example, lower income households. Um, and so, in that line as well, some results could be exploited, maybe to know more about redistribution, not just through through that channel, but more in terms of wealth. Yeah. Um, Do you want to respond? I want to have some, some meetings. Yes, uh, thanks a lot about, about the discussions. Like, the, as I mentioned, it's still kind of work in progress. Like, what we are currently adding to the paper is exactly, I think, you know, what you are alluding to, like a table where we compare our demographics to like data for from the panel of household finances from the Bundesbank. The issue is like the most uh, recent data we have access to is like from 2017, but I think it would still be useful. We have that, that's definitely something. Yeah, we are working on. I'm also very sympathetic to like, you know, looking at the heterogeneity here by income. Right? So we currently write already, but I think we have to back that up a bit better. It's like we are more on the upper end of the income distribution, and people on average are most likely better informed relative to like the general population. But you know, we, we definitely have to do a little bit more here. So, like, mm, one of the reasons why we actually added this kind of, you know, 8.7, the highest in 70 years, is like, Oftentimes uh, in service, you tend to see that people kind of anyway expect like a very high uh, inflation. And then they now learn it's 8.7, maybe actually we thought ex ante before like looking at Germans, that for them it might actually not be that high. So we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. But given that the, that information like was given to control uh, households and treated households, like hopefully this shouldn't actually interfere with our treatment effects. And so we could still. Kind of interpret those and like you know, I definitely I'm sympathetic that to the extent that people are aware of like what inflation currently is, they might have already adjusted their portfolios. We can actually check that in the administrative bank data. I think that's definitely something to look at. Can you see if the bank had adjusted interest rates? Yeah, so like at least like deposit rates, no. No. And can you see if they moved their their savings? No, that's exactly so. Like, that's what I'm going to look at. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, a question about dynamics. Here, right? mm -hmm. So, so uh, when you do this example, fifty thousand to thirty-eight thousand. Yeah. So you're assuming that it stays eight point seven percent for I don't know how many years. Mm -hmm. While obviously you know, all the projections, yeah. Yeah. hopefully, yeah. Yeah. this thing. So the, the effects actually would be much milder than your example that you actually give to, to them. So mm -hmm. that's first thing. The second thing is that you have data on wages in these three months or six months. But, but obviously, if I think about the intertemporal budget constraints of the households, uh, right? So it all depends. So there are two components of wealth, right? So financial wealth and human wealth. Mm -hmm. And the, what is going to happen to your human wealth, it depends if you expect your wages to pick up with that yeah. inflation or not. And that, again, is, 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 it's important for yeah. you know, the no, Excellent uh, points. So maybe, you know, the way I would think about it, it's like, you know, we were very clear in our treatments that from, you know, you took out, let's say, a three-year loan, fixed rate interest last year, but then now inflation went up from the level back then to the current level. We interpolate that linearly, and then we say we assume that inflation stays at that level until the end like, you know, we just want to make people aware of this uh, re-evaluation of nominal assets and liabilities. And we are clear about our assumptions. And actually, they can click on the link where they see the calculations with it. It's not that, you know, we want to be uh, kind of as realistic as possible, but just like, you know, that's one example. And then we see how people react to that. That's maybe the first. And then, like, in terms of, like, you know, kind of this human wealth channel, I'm super sympathetic to that. But like, you know, due to our randomization and the fact we tell everyone prevailing inflation rate, that's a little bit of one of the reasons why we did that. We wanted to make sure that at least this part, hopefully we can actually, actually keep constant. Like uh, if there's any kind of re-evaluation on human capital. Ask, you could have asked, what do you think will happen? Here? Oh yeah, it's like, you know, it was already 18 minutes, so it was a very bit on the long side, but you know, maybe it would be useful in a, in a future iteration to actually also listen to that. So the information is related to gross positions or net positions. So it's like net nominal position relative to cost wealth. So like the way we do it in the survey, we first 
elicit basin categories, the overall cross well. And then we ask them at the position level, the fraction of like, you know, uh, nominal savings as per cross well, the fraction of equity of cross wells and so on. That's how we then define uh, net nominal position as a fraction of cross wells. And so if I count $100 in there, $100 in savings, I get two levels, or I get one that says, I didn't lose anything. My so your net wealth would so like your cross wealth is a hundred, yeah. and then you have like the net normal position in your case like would be a CMO. Yeah. So they would receive that they 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 lose one hundred again. Yeah. Okay. I think it's fascinating paper. So I have a, do you have any hunch of why you find the effect on non durables and compared to durables on consumption? Well, it's like the way I would think about it, it's like, you know, the global expenditure are way more lumpy and maybe the re-evaluation is maybe not sufficiently big that in this short time period, like over the next four weeks, we would now start to buy a new car necessarily, but, you know, that's the way I would think about it. So do you have a sense on whether the changes in perceived network correlate with the actual network? So do people get closer to like, the actual fluctuations of their net worth because I'm thinking, I mean, you're priming then to think about the mortgage and yeah. written housing has been dropping the real value in Germany in the past couple of years. Like, uh, so something, measure net worth and see. like in, uh, for, for housing, it's a bit tricky because we know whether they kind of have a mortgage, we know what they say in the survey, we know where they zip code is, so we could maybe back it out, but so, like it's hard to then uh, kind of. Uh, Make the statement, but you know, it's definitely something we thought about potentially whether we can make statements or whether they become more accurate, but it's a little bit of a tricky, uh, tricky endeavor. I, I, ha I have a, this is more kind of my, not more tangential, but <laughs> if you look at uh, surveys in Germany historically, one of the things that Germans fear the most is inflation. Uh -huh. So it, it doesn't seem to be coming from this kind of channel, right? Because if you're saying, I mean, it seems like they are not aware of how much they can lose about for, through saving nominal savings from inflation. So I wonder how how one squares the two. Yeah, no. like... <laughs> it's actually, I think it's also for me the biggest conundrum. Like the Germans are always most concerned about inflation, but the Germans are also the one that use the Sparbo yeah. to put their money in the banks. Like <laughs> it's all totally perverse, and I cannot. Uh, it's like well, you know. <laughs> You know, we have this paper with Francesco da Punto and Marcel Prokopczyk in the rest that where we say like, you know, that potentially like it is plus towards the financial sector might play a role, but, you know, not sure how far we want to push that. Yeah. How much the inflation in 2023, 1923. Yeah. Okay, so thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.